last time we finished talking about the Gibbs Duum relationship. And remember that the final result that we got looks something like uh, S dt equals V dp uh, plus N V mu equals zero, okay? And just to remind you, we have intensive para parameters here. So they, it relates the intensive parameters. And remember that we're going to um, apply all these things to a bunch of problems in the very near future here. So these might've looked just like mathematical uh, tricks, but you'll see how they come in useful in a lot of different situations. Now, the one other thing that I can do here with this relationship is I can divide by N, okay? And notice, oh, and I have a equal sign here where I think I should have a minus sign. Um, Sorry about that. So this right here is a minus sign, okay? And now I can uh, solve for d mu. And you have to be careful because we have mu's and u's, okay? At least in this expression, we don't have a u, we just have mu. But we solve for d mu and we then get v dp minus little s dt. And actually, let me make this look little here. So now this is written in terms of the molar quantities. Oops. In terms of the molar quantities. I'll just abbreviate it. So these are, uh, oops, not that. Let's underline the right thing. So these are the molar quantities here, okay? Now, the one thing that I need to stress right now, because I'm gonna be saying things that are probably gonna be confusing to you. And I just realized <clears throat> this may be confusing, <clears throat> excuse me. But remember, we talked about the fact <clears throat> that equations of state, like for example, U are functions of S, V and N, okay? And these are all extensive <clears throat> properties, okay? And for an equation of state, these have to be intensive properties. So if you see intensive properties in there, <clears throat> they're not equations of state, except if we do the molar things. So if I look at the molar properties, I'll get lowercase u is a function of little s, little v, and one, which is equivalent to it just being in terms of two parameters. So this is still an equation of state. I'm sorry. Fundamental equation, I'm saying the wrong thing. So this is still a fundamental equation, meaning they can get everything you need out of that equation. So usually when we talk about intensive quantities, so for example, uh, up here, you know, like temperature, pressure, and chemical potential, those come about by taking derivatives of things that are extensive and it gives you intensive properties. But this still is a fundamental relationship. So even though the molar quantities S and V are intensive, this is still a fundamental equation. Okay, so you can still get everything you need. So, uh, so basically, if I give you something that instead of S and V had like temperature in it, then that would not be a fundamental equation because temperature is intensive, okay? And I'm gonna talk about that more again, but I just wanted to stress here when we say that to be a fundamental equation has to be a function of the extensive parameters, what we mean is either the extensive parameters or the molar versions of those extensive parameters. They're both okay. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, I don't wanna dwell on it too long, but I just wanna make clear that that's the situation here. And then in this case, uh, what we find <clears throat> with this gibbs duhm relationship is that the three parameters are related to each other. So like I said up here, they're related to each other. So what ends up happening is that, for example, mu is a function of T and P, or T is a function of mu and P, 
for uh, p is a function of mu and t, okay? So, uh, so because they're related, you can express each one of these in terms of the other two parameters, okay? So it reduces the number of parameters that you have by one, which is useful, okay? And the other thing to remind you is that this expression that gives do them here, I wrote it for a one component system, okay? Now, if we have other properties like magnetic field, dipole moments, electric fields, many different kinds of particles, then the more general form of this equation is going to be S dt uh, plus some, and I, I should uh, be a little neater here. So S dt, these are all capitals. These are uh, not the intensive, I'm sorry, not the extensive parameters. And then we sum over all the extensive parameters dot the intensive parameters. This is a J right here, okay? So, so this is the more general version of the Gibbs do. I mean, you can see that the one we wrote is a special case of that, okay? And it's just easier to show the ideas with the special case, okay? So, uh, so typically for, for a system, with our components. So for a system of our components, we usually have R plus one thermodynamic degrees of freedom. Okay. So, um, so given that, I think it's easier just to apply these things to special, some special cases so you can kind of see how this works. Now, the other thing to point out is that we've been working here in the energy representation, because remember energy is a function of SVN. We can also work in the entropy representation Okay, and in the entropy representation, this general expression is gonna look like J equals zero to R. And then we have the extensive parameters times the in intensive ones. And the sum of those is equal to zero. And I forgot to put that up here. So I'll put it here. The sum of those is equal to zero. That's very important because that's what relates them to each other. Okay, and then in the case of a single component, we're gonna have something looks like U D one over T plus V D P over T minus, uh, and actually I shouldn't say single component. This, this is still general, but it's no magnetic fields and stuff like that, so. Move this over and make some room here. And then we're going to subtract the sum of k equals one to r of n sub k d mu sub k over t equals zero. Okay. So in this case, we can, for example, have a gas with a lot of different components in there, like xenon, argon, nitrogen, and whatever. And that would be the chemical potential for each one of those, okay? But because they're all mixed together, we have a, a single pressure and temperature for, for the whole system, okay? So the weird thing here is, and we're, we're gonna do some examples with this. Now the differentials are, the parameter one over T and P over T, okay? So we're considering those things as being the parameters, okay? Good, so, um, so now we've kind of introduced thermodynamics. And so let's kind of summarize the, the formal structure of thermodynamics, okay? So uh, here for simplicity, we're gonna assume a single component. So 
for simplicity. We're going to look at a single component. And this generalizes in a straightforward way, so we don't need to uh, uh, worry about that. So first, if we look at the energy, the energy U is a function of S, V, and N, okay? Now, something like the volume is easy to measure, the entropy is not so easy to measure. Now, the things I'm going to stress here, you're going to look at this and say, oh, this is so obvious, I know this. But it'll be these things that you need to think about when you're solving certain problems, or a lot of the problems we'll be talking about. So the first thing that's going to happen is, because u is a function of SVN, we can differentiate with respect to any one of those parameters. And remember, the temperature is defined as a partial of u with respect to S. Okay, So we have this function of SVN. We differentiate it. And the important thing is when we get the temperature, this temperature is also a function of S, V, and N, okay? Because we're gonna use that, okay? And if we look at the molar quantities, which is easier to do, and we'll see how that makes things so much easier, it's gonna be a function of the molar entropy and the molar volume, okay? So you should always keep in mind what the variables are for a particular representation. Okay, so for energy, it's SVN. And similarly, pressure is minus partial U with respect to volume. And the pressure is also a function of SVN because we're starting with the same equation of state and differentiating it. And then that's gonna be given by P in terms of the molar quantities again, okay? And then finally, the chemical potential is gonna be given by a partial of U with respect to N. And that's gonna be a function of SVN. So I'm just trying to beat this into your heads that it's a function of SVN. And in terms of the molar quantities, it's gonna be a function of just two parameters, okay? Now, importantly, th these are called equations of state. Okay. And in order to determine all properties of a thermodynamic system, you need all three of these equations of state. So you need all three equations of state to get the system's properties. So I wanna stress again that the fundamental equation, this U of SVN gives us all properties of the system. And it makes sense because we got the equations of state from that fundamental equation, okay? And then each one of these fundamental equations alone is not enough to get all the properties, but the three together can be used to get the three properties, okay? And uh, you know, one way that we can obviously do it is remember we can use the Euler equation because remember with the Euler equation, we take you know, T times S minus P times V plus mu times N and that's the energy. So that'll give us the fundamental equation back again. So remember U is equal to T S minus P V uh, plus mu N. So if I have these three equations, three equations for T, P, and U, I plug those in there and I'll get the fundamental equation, okay? So I can recover it that way. So the first point to stress is that these three equations of state are equivalent to the fundamental equation. I'm abbreviating this greatly because I don't want to spend time writing and we've said it in words multiple times. Now here's another thing that's kind of neat is that if we know two equations of state, so if two equations of state 
are known, okay, we can use the Gibbs Duum relation uh, to, to get the third equation of state. Okay. Now, the problem with this is if you look at the gibbs duhm relation, which, uh, okay, I have to go really far away here to get, uh, the gibbs duhm equation is a uh, differential, okay? So what ends up happening is you get an integration constant. Okay, so it's good up to an integration constant. And so we'll talk about that in a bit. And what I'm going to do later is I'm going to we're going to we're going to derive the equation of state for an ideal gas, and that's kind of key to the way thermodynamics works. And it's actually very useful to understand how to do that. And we're going to do it in, in like I say, in a couple of different ways. And one of the ways we're going to use the gibbs duhm relationship, and then we'll use another method in addition to that, so you can kind of see how this all works. Okay. And also uh, because of this what we find is that two equations of state can be integrated to get a fundamental equation. But again, there's gonna be that, that integration constant. So let me show you as an example, okay? So as an example, we have this uh, gibbs duhm relationship. Remember d mu was equals, I should say example. So d mu was given by T. And remember, we remember it's a function of molar S molar V times molar entropy differential minus pressure as a function of S and V is DV, okay? So we can get uh, mu minus mu naught by just doing this integral. And we're gonna go through doing these kinds of things, okay? But it comes just from that. But again, like I said, you get this integration constant, okay? Now, uh, in terms of the fundamental relations, we talked about two of them. And just to remind you, the first one is the energy, which is a function of S, V, and N. And again, this is where I wanna stress that these are all extensive. And then we can solve that for the entropy, which will make the entropy a function of u, v, and n, okay? So one thing I'm gonna say now, which is not gonna maybe resonate at this point, and let me just point at these, these are all extensive, is that when you're trying to solve a problem, you should look to see what quantities you have to work with. And then that will tell you what representation you need to use. So if I give you some relationships in terms of energies, volumes, and numbers of particles, then you, knew, then you know you should be working in the entropy representation, okay? So be aware of the variables that you're, that you're uh, using. And remember, all knowledge about the system comes from here. Okay. okay, so I think you got the picture, okay? Now, we can easily re-express any of these quantities in terms of another quantity. So for example, this expression for U, I can write the entropy, let's say, in terms of the temperature, okay? I can do that. 
And the way that I do that is I differentiate U with respect to S to get temperature. And then I use that expression to eliminate the entropy. Okay, so you can do that algebraically. But now notice this is intensive. Okay, and because that's intensive, this is not a fundamental relation. Okay, so you can't get everything from there. And just to remind you again, this T is going to be partial U with respect to S. And that's a very important thing. Now, why is this not a fundamental relation? Okay, I can show you diagrammatically simply. So let's plot here U versus S, let's say, okay? So here's my U versus S, okay? Now, what I wanna do is plot U versus T. Okay, so here's U versus T. So uh, this we get, as I said, by inverting this other equation. Okay, they look kind of the same, but they're not really. Okay. So, um, and actually, you know, for an ideal gas, the energy and the temperature are proportional to each other. So they could look like the same curve, okay? So that's going in this direction. Now, if I go backwards again, okay, what will happen is because T is given by a derivative of U, when I go backwards, I get an integration constant. And so I can be here, I can be here, you know, I can be kind of anywhere over here. Okay, so I don't know what curve I'm on. And so the point is that in a fundamental relation, at every point here, I can calculate quantities. And so for example, if I wanna get the temperature at this point, I just get it from this slope. And to generate this red curve, I'm just plotting the slopes that I got, okay? But the problem is when I go backwards again, there's gonna be an integration constant, so that curve can be shifted. And that's what makes it not a fundamental relation. And you'll see if you try to get all the properties of the system, it won't work, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, good. Okay, now I'm gonna go through an example. And let me put here, this is super important because this is gonna dictate how you approach trying to derive a fundamental equation, okay? So understand how this works. And one of the things I would recommend is after class, try to do the same problem I'm gonna give here as an example on your own to see if you understand all the arguments that go through doing this derivation. Okay, so let's say I'm an experimentalist like David, and I'm going to do some experiments. And from my experiments, I come up with some equations of state. Okay, so I have some system that I'm experimenting on. And I find experimentally, let's say, that the energy of the system goes as one half PV. Okay and that the temperature goes as some constant times u to the 3 halves divided by v n to the 1 half, okay? These are empirically determined, okay? Empirically. I can't spell it, so I won't write it down. Empirically determined. Okay, I'll say experimentally determined. Experimentally determined. Okay, so now we'll see how we get an equation of state out of this. Are you raising your hand as a question or you're stretching? Stretching. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let me just look at this expression here first for the energy. Uh, why, is not, why is that not a fundamental equation? Just by looking at it without knowing anything else, why is it not fundamental?
Because it's it's defined in intensive properties. Exactly. P is intensive. Okay. So this is not fundamental. I don't have room to say relations. I'll say I'll just say not fundamental. And you know what it is. What if P was constant? It doesn't matter. Well, if, if it was just a constant, but not the pressure, then it would be fundamental. But as long as it's one of the parameters of the problem. Yeah. Okay, good. So they're not fundamental. Okay. The next step we do is we look at this and we say to ourselves, hmm, if I invert these equations, notice that P is gonna be a function of U and V, okay? And T is gonna be a function of U, V, and N, okay? Because I can invert those. So now I see that these are in terms of parameters in what representation? The entropy. Very good, it's the entropy representation. So, so aha, uh -huh, now we're ready to go. So the first thing we do is we actually solve for those things. So uh, first, um, let's say, let's go to the, to the T because that's a little bit easier. Uh, and in the entropy representation, remember what we actually need is one over T, okay? So that's the thing we, uh, we want. Um, so that's the thing we're gonna get. But before we even do that, let's turn everything into molar quantities and we'll see it makes it a lot easier too, okay? So first, we're gonna go into molar quantities. Okay. So every step I'm taking here is super important. So think about everything we're doing here. So for example, when I have this T squared, I have A and then U, right? Well, U, I can write as uh, this, this U times N, okay? And then the V I can write as N molar V, I'll put parentheses around them. Okay, so I'm just using the definition. And then uh, N I'm gonna leave as it is, okay? Now watch what happens. Something really beautiful happens here is when I look at the N dependence here, okay? What's gonna happen is there, I'm gonna get N to the three halves divided by n times n to the one half. And then after that, I have all my other stuff, a uh, u to the three halves over v, okay? So what ended up happening here is all the n's cancel. Isn't that beautiful? So one of the things you can do, and remember, uh, there, there's a homework problem. I can't remember if you did it already or if it's the next homework assignment where you're given equations of state and you're asked if, if these are reasonable equations of state. And one thing you have to do is to make sure that everything is intensive or extensive, you know, in the right combination so that it works out to be the same on both sides of the equation. In this equation, notice this is intensive. And if you look at the right-hand side and work it all out, you'll see that it's intensive. So as long as that's true, if you wanna be quick about it, you don't have to go through the step. You can just immediately take all of the things like U and V up here and just turn them to little u and little v. You don't have to go through this process of putting the ends in there because if the expression is correct, the ends have to cancel each other out, okay? Good. So, uh, so now let me just write this as A U to the three halves v to the minus one, okay? So what I really want here is I want this one over t, and now it's a function of just u and v. So when I take the reciprocal of this thing, I'm gonna get one over a, u, and v, but then I'll, when I take the square root here, 
Instead of three halves, I'll get three quarters. Let me make room here. Three quarters. And V to the minus one will become V to the minus one half. Okay. And then I need to take the square root of A. Sorry, I made that really tiny. I don't know if you can see that. And then let me just write this as A to the minus a half, U to the minus three quarters, V to the one half. Okay, so you can see why I'm writing it all instead of putting in the fractions just in that exponential form. Okay. What, where did the square root n come from above? I forget. So uh, if you look at the expression here, there's a t squared. Yeah. You have to take the square root of both sides and then take the reciprocal. No, I'm just wondering where the n to the power one half came from. Here? Yeah, I forgot. That was just that was what you determined experimentally. You did the oh, okay. Got it. Yeah, yeah. It was in the original. Yeah, it was in the original expression, right? So you can see that went away, and we get that expression. Now it turns out that the uh, the other expression we want is for the pressure. Okay, and so we immediately can say that the the pressure is going to be two little mu over v. Okay. Oops, sorry, little v, because now we learned our lesson, right? We just replace capital with lowercase to go from extensive to intensive because we've divided everything by n. But what we really want is we want p over t as a function of mu and v, okay? So I need to multiply that by this expression, okay? So, P over T is two mu over V. So let me write it as V to the minus one half. Then we have it times A to the minus one half, U to the minus three quarters, V to the one half. So notice I'm going through this in gory detail. because so I just want you to see exactly how this works. And so finally, when we're done, we get that P is gonna be two times A to the minus one half. So I'll pull out the constants. And then the U I have, u to the one, u to the minus three quarters, so it's u to the minus, I'm sorry, u to the plus one quarter. And then v to the minus a half, v to a half. Oh, did I make a mistake somewhere there? I don't think there was, those were supposed to cancel, are they? Oh, I see what I did. Do you see this? That's v, not v to the minus one half, so I just wrote it wrong. Okay, that's just to the minus one. Sorry about that. So then uh, those two together give me V to the minus a half, okay? So I think I did that right. Okay, good, I did it right. All right, good. So uh, this is P over T, I forgot to write that. So now we have one over T, and we have P over T. So let me just highlight that. Okay. Good. So now we're ready to solve the problem, okay? So what we do is we go back to our original equation for the entropy. Remember dS, I'm gonna write it in molar form, okay? Is equal to one over T du uh, plus, one, I'm oh, sorry, plus P over T dV, okay? That's just our expression that we had in molar form, okay? Well, all I do is I take these expressions that I've derived and I plug them in. So I'm gonna get A to the minus one half, and notice that factors out. So let me just factor that out over here. And so what I'll get is U to the minus three quarters, v to the one half du. And as usual, I run out of space. And then we'll have plus p over t, which is two u to the one quarter v to the minus one half dv. Okay, good. Now, we wanna ask the question, is this 
a perfect differential. Because if it's not, it can't be integrated. Now, I want to say it is. You know, you're going to say it is. Good. And the reason why it has to be is that we derive this from these equations of state. So it has to be. But let's check it. Okay. So the way that we check it is if we look at this coefficient here and take the partial derivative of that with respect to V, that should be equal to the partial derivative of this with respect to U. Take that as a rule, okay? We kind of talked about it before when we were talking about imperfect differentials and how you can tell. Just take this as a rule and don't um, worry about where it comes from for now, okay? So let's check that. So if I take partial with respect to V of U to the minus three quarters, V to the one half, then I'm gonna get one half U to the minus three quarters times V to the one half, okay? Now let's mm -hmm. take partial minus with half. What's that? V to the minus one half? Uh, e to the minus one half, thank you. Good, Zero. keep me honest here. And if I differentiate two U to the one quarter, V to the minus one half, put parentheses around there, then I'll get one quarter of two, which is one half, U to the minus three quarters, V to the minus one half. Those two are equal. Hooray, it's a, it's a perfect differential, okay? So uh, the next thing I can do is just integrate this darn thing. So note that if I look at this first expression, the first expression, let me just put an arrow coming down here. So the thing in parentheses looks like D, actually, let me do this as partial, yeah. So that looks like partial, uh, cause I'm integrating it with respect to U. So that looks like partial with respect to U of u to the four thirds with a minus sign v to the one half. And when I increase exponent by one, I get this, okay? So that's what this first term here looks like. Because I'm just integrating with respect to u, okay? And this one I'll integrate with respect to v. So that looks like partial with respect to v. Uh, let's see, if I integrate v to the one minus one half, I get v to the one half divided by two is like multiplying by four. And then I get uh, u to the one quarter. You did this in such a complicated way. I'm just trying to show you that each term you can integrate directly, okay? Or you can do it like you would do it. You just look at it and say, okay, ds is a to the minus one half times u to the minus one quarter uh, times four times v to the one half. Isn't it plus one quarter? I'm sorry, plus one quarter. And then minus one half? Uh, no, plus one half, <laughs> never mind. Is that okay? Yeah, it's plus That's one. That's good. Yeah. And what you can do is, uh, oh, oh, and uh, I'm integrating it, so I don't need uh, to say ds, but, I do need to say uh, that this is like S minus S naught, okay? That's the difference in, in entropy when uh, doing that uh, integration, okay? Good, so we're done. And hopefully you can see what we're, what we're doing here, okay? Now, uh, there's one just housekeeping thing. I can take this expression and multiply through by n to turn everything into extensive parameters, okay? So when I do that, S becomes capital S, S naught becomes capital S naught. Then I have equals A to the minus one half. I'll pull the four over here, okay? And then uh, we'll have U to the one quarter, V to the one half. And I have to multiply by n, so let me uh, make an upper room, okay?
Now, the one thing that I have to be careful about is remember that I have a divided by n here, and I have a divided by n here. Because remember, that's the definition of little u and little v. So when I put the whole thing together, let me put the answer here. I'm going to get 4n. Oops. So let's look at the n. So I have right here, I have an n to the minus 1 quarter. Here I have an n to the minus 1 half. So these two together are n to the minus 3 quarters. OK. And uh, then when I multiply that by n, I get n to the minus 1 quarter. And then I'll get u to the 1 quarter to the one half. You all agree with that? I'll, I'll cheat and look at my notes to see if I got the same thing. Yeah, I did. Very good. So now I have my equation of state. Isn't that beautiful? So the whole point of this, just you know, think about it and make sure that you understand, is that we started from something that we measured. So we measured equations of state. And then we use those to go through this process to get the fundamental equation. And now everything comes out of this. And note how we didn't have to worry about the, the end part of it because we did everything in molar form. And then the, in the end, we fixed it by putting the end back. And we didn't have to worry about that part of the equation. Isn't that kind of cool how that worked out? I hope you appreciate the beauty and simplicity of that. Okay. And then the one other thing is we can also, if you want, solve for u, okay, which is easy. That's just gonna be s minus s naught. We divide by four from this, then we'll get n to the one quarter, v to the minus one half, all to the fourth power. I just inverted it. So now we have whatever is more convenient, okay? What happened to our a in the, our constant in the final? Oh, it's, I forgot it. Okay, so there's an a to the minus one half here. Uh, let me just put it here, a to the minus one half. And so when I invert this, there's gonna be uh, an a to the one half in here, the a to the one half. Not that it matters, I guess. That's just the yeah. boundary condition. But yeah, but we wanna not make mistakes along the way. So that's how we're gonna do it. Okay, good. So any questions about that? Think about this, go through it, and then next time we're going to go through and, de and derive the fundamental relation for a simple gas, and you'll see how that works. And the great thing about that is the expression looks kind of complicated for the fundamental relation, but it all comes from PV is you know NRT, and you'll see how easily that, that comes.